Amen. I want to share with you today. Please pray with me uh, as we go before the Lord. Lord, I can't do what you can do. I have no influence. I have no power. No, uh, I have nothing that can cause a person to be spiritually fed and matured. So, Lord, right now I surrender and submit to the power of your Holy Spirit, trusting you to do that which you have given, trusting you with the results, the response, and the word. Help me, O oh God, to decrease and you increase. Give me the faith to stand behind the cross. servant is listening. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We want to share with you uh, briefly today. Amen. I'll try to be brief. I don't know how it all is going to turn out. Every time I say I try to be brief, I, <laughs> it gets long. <laughs> Amen. But we have to say what the Lord says, uh, wants us to say. Amen. I see that it's about 12.02, amen. And so we want to share with you uh, for a few minutes uh, what God placed in our spirits and in our hearts, continuing uh, to be inspired by Dr. Charles Stanley and the wisdom that God gave him that he shared with the world and, uh, and the wisdom and the insight that God gave me through prayer to share uh, alongside that that uh, gift and that uh, inspiration that Dr. Stanley had. We give him all the praise. Uh, give God all the praise. Give uh, Dr. Stanley uh, adoration. Amen. And thank thankfulness for being obedient to God and not only obedient in his life, but sharing and recording what God had given him. Amen. You know, it's important to write things down. Uh, the good things that God uh, shares with you. Uh, what I've learned is when I don't write it down, when he gives it to me, sometimes it does, it never comes back. <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking, well, what did you say? What did you say? Lord? <laughs> and the Lord just says, <laughs> Well, I gave it to you. You didn't write it down. He may or may not give it to you again, but then if I plead with him. He'll give it back to you. <laughs> uh, but I won't take that for granted. When God gives you something, uh, write it down uh, because it may not necessarily come back again. Amen. Especially if it's a nugget of wisdom uh, from him. Amen. Amen. So we want to share with you today. Uh, from the text that's found in 2 Kings uh, chapter 6, verse 17. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And we'd like to use just for a subject thought, what do you see? What do you see? That's an interesting, provocative question. What do you see? Some people see the glass half empty. Some people see the glass half full. Some people don't even see the glass. <laughs> Amen. But if I were to summarize the principle that 
is at the heart of this message that was shared through the inspiration that was given to Dr. Stanley. It would be this message, this sentence. Trusting God means looking beyond what we can see to what God sees. Whew. Let that sink in. Trusting God means looking beyond what we see to what God sees. Many times what we see stops us and hinders us from moving forward. Sometimes we search for jobs and, and look, we look in the paper where there's no job here, there's no, there's no openings over here, they're not hiring here and there. But do you know that many of the jobs that are available are never advertised? <laughs> they are never advertised. And so you have to knock. You have to seek. Amen. And you have to ask. Because many times things that are really of significance are never really advertised publicly. Amen. Trusting God means looking beyond what we can see to what God sees. And the, the subject title is, what do you see? What do you see? What do you see? When you look at your life, what do you see? When you look at situations, what do you see? Do you only see the physical, the physicality of the situation? Do you only see the negative of the situation? Do you only see the, the, the hindrances in the situation? Do you only see uh, the, the, the things that, uh, that appeal to you in the situation? Amen. And in this particular chapter, we see something that gets our attention. We see a prophet called, his name was Elisha. He was, the, he was mentored by Elijah with a J. Amen. And he, Elisha asked Elijah to bless him with a double portion. And Elisha, when he was taken up into heaven in a chariot, threw his mantle on Elisha. And Elisha received many of the gifts and powers that Elijah had. In other words, Elisha, with an S, was the successor to Elijah with a J. Amen. What does that tell us? That tells us that you can't just look at the immediate and the present, but you've got to prepare also for the future. Come on, y'all. Amen. Amen. If you stay just in the present, then you're going to miss the opportunity to pass on something that God has given you or has entrusted to you that will prevent you from passing it on to the next generation. Amen. And so one of the things that you have to look at is who takes my place? I, I'm sitting here thinking even right now, who takes my place as pastor of Word of God ministry? Yes. I'll have to ask God to send some folks. Yes. <laughs> Amen. 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 But don't think I don't think about that because I do. If this is of God, God will send the successor to me. Yes. If your business is of God, God will send a successor to your business Amen. so that it will continue to be what God called it to be. If your gift is ministry or your gift is music, God will send a successor yes. for music after you have moved on or have gone on. Yes. And so it's important for us to understand what we see, because if we only look at the immediacy of things, 
then we miss what God sees down the road. That's why it's important for us to not stop at what we see in the immediacy, what we see in the physical, what we see right now, what we see is going on around us. We can't stop there because those actually uh, are, are impacting our natural senses. What are you saying? I'm saying that many times we only look into the natural and miss the spiritual. Come on. Amen. We look into the natural and miss the God-given power of the spiritual. We can look at a situation and say, well, that's the end. But if we look to God, God said, no, that's not the end. When Elijah left, Elijah left, that wasn't the end of the prophets. Amen. That wasn't the end of the ministry. God called Elijah to take Elijah's place. God looked beyond the immediate situation. He looked beyond the physical situation. He looked beyond what uh, the physical perception and senses uh, respond to. And he looks way down the road. And we cannot gain that perspective of God in our physical state. Come on, y'all. When we look at things in the physical, that is about all we can do. It takes the spirit of God, the spiritual eyes of God, to see into the future. Because there's only one who knows the future. And that's God. Come on, y'all. And God already knows what you need. Come on now. Before you even ask him. God already knows your desires even before they are formed on your lips. God already knows what concerns you even before you pray. Because God looks beyond our immediate and looks way on down the line. And too many Christians stop at the at the natural. Come on, y'all. Paul called them carnal Christians, worldly kind of uh, natural Christians. Have you ever met Christians that they, they're more like the world people, worldly people, than they are Christian? Every now and then you might hear something about God, but their behavior is not any different than that of a non-Christian. They'll cuss you out just as quick as a non-Christian. Come on, y'all. I'm, I'm hurting somebody here. Amen? They're just as mean as a non-Christian. Amen? They're just as vindictive as a non-Christian. They, they hold grudges just like a non-Christian. In other words, if you, if you put a non-Christian and the Christian side by, the carnal Christian side by side, you probably couldn't tell any difference in their behavior. Amen. The only difference is that they profess Christ. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You see, if you don't continue your journey with Jesus, then you will, you will stop wherever you are. That's why some Christians that have been Christians for 20 years are still the same as they were 20 years ago. They're still just as prideful, just as selfish, just as complaining, just as stubborn as they were 20 years ago. How can that happen? Because they have not surrendered themselves to God. Amen. God is not going to force you to love him. 
God is not going to force you to obey him. But there's blessings in obedience. There's blessing in surrender. There's abundant life in allowing God the free reign of your life. Amen. And so here we are in this chapter, and, 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 and the Syrians are attacking Israel. This is the split kingdom. This is the ten northern tribes of Israel. At one time, Israel was one complete nation of 12 tribes. But after Solomon, the Lord told them that I'm going to divide the kingdom. And so there were ten northern tribes and two southern tribes. They called the northern tribes Israel, and they called the southern tribes Judah. It's out of Judah that Jesus came through and was born through that lineage. And so here you have this uh, Israel of the north, and the Syrians are wanting to take over. They're wanting to dominate. They're wanting to, to, to cause Israel to be subjected to them. And every time that they prepare an attack on Israel, God's prophet Elisha told the king of Israel, don't go this way. Don't go that way. Because they're waiting on you. How many times has God showed us and told us things uh, that we shouldn't do or warned us against doing certain things or going certain places, but we do not heed it? Come on, y'all. We go on our own way thinking that we, our way is better than God's way. Amen. Only to find out some years later the pain, through pain, heartache, and brokenness that we were wrong. Amen. There are several lessons that we can gain right quick from this, from, from just Elisha telling uh, the king about uh, the attack that's coming. The Bible says that the king of Assyria, of Syria, <laughs> Wonder how in the world did the Israelites find out about my plans? He even said to his own people, okay, which one of you literally, what he was saying, which one of you is a snitch? <laughs> which one of you going to tell the enemy what I'm planning on doing? And they spoke up and said, none of us have told the enemy, what you're doing. It's the man of God, Elijah, that tells him what you speak in your bedroom. He tells the king of Israel what's about to happen. What can you glean from that little story? First of all, God always speaks to his servants. Come on, y'all. If you are a servant of God, I mean a real servant, surrendered, submitted, and obedient unto God, God will show you and tell you things that you don't know about, things that you've never heard of, things that you may not understand, but one thing you understand, that this is of God. This is of the Lord. God always tells his servants, what he's about to do. Yes. Amen. Wow. Take that lesson away. When you are a servant of God, God, God can tell you things way before they happen. I remember the day that I got the call that my brother had passed away suddenly. Before I got the news. God spoke into my ear. There's a little thing that happens when somebody is going to die that I know. Now, I know this sounds spooky and crazy, but I'm telling you the truth. And, and I got that spoken in my ear 
that morning, early that morning, I wondered, okay, who am I, who is going to die? It's always somebody that I know. He doesn't always tell me who it is, but it's going to be somebody that I know. And about three hours later, my sister-in-law called my sister. My sister called me and told me about my brother. I was not overly surprised. I was surprised but not overly surprised because God had already let me know. You're getting ready to hear about a death of somebody you know. He doesn't always tell me who that person is, but you're going to hear it. So he was preparing me. And uh, am I bragging? No, I'm not. I'm just declaring the truth. God will always let his servant know what's about to happen, particularly if his servant is walking in his will, as Elisha was. Secondly, God always warns his people. That's the other message you, got to, you can take away. God always warns his people of imminent danger, of, of things that are going to be detrimental to you and to your life. He always warns you. The third thing, the interesting thing about this chapter is after Elijah warned the king of Israel and saved them from being destroyed, the king of Israel got mad at Elijah because he thought Elijah was causing all the problem. <laughs> Isn't that why? You do what God wants you to do. You do it the right way for the right reason, for the glory of God. It saves people's lives. It helps people. And the very people you help, the very people you, you bring about uh, uh, kindness to and, and, and niceties to and, and love to, and all of that, then all of a sudden, they turn against you. They turn against you. Doing God's will, this is the third thing, doing God's will can make even the people you help turn against you. The king of Israel got angry with Elisha because he thought that Elisha was creating the problem that caused hunger in the Israel nation. Amen. Isn't it wild how your good and your good intentions and your good good treatment and your obedience to God makes enemies even of your friends? Amen. To see what God is able to accomplish. You got to have two things, trust and obedience. That equals success, trust and obedience. One of the things that this chapter teaches us is that faith grows through challenges. If you want your faith to, go, to grow, you've got to go through the challenge that God has before you. And the greater your faith, the greater the challenge. In other words, God takes you to the max of your faith so that he can extend and grow your faith to the next level. You wonder why things seem to get harder and harder all the time. It's because God is growing your faith. God is growing your trust in him. God is growing your ability to rely upon him. Amen? Amen? Not only does he grow your, your, your reliability upon him, but he deepens. Amen? I just want to share this. I had to write all this down because it's good. Deepens our dependence on him. Every situation that happens in your life, you have two choices. One, you can reject God's will and counsel and do it on your own, or you can grow and, and your dependence on God becomes deeper. The more you depend on God, the more successful you're going to be. Come on, y'all. Just ask David. 
David depended on who? On God. And God blessed him. God blessed him. Trials will continue to get harder and harder as God grows your faith more and more. Understand that. Understand that. Listen, without strong faith, without strong faith, we can become angry because things are happening to us. We can become bitter because things are not going our way. We can become vengeful. Well, you were my friend, but now you're not. I'm getting you back. You stabbed me in the back. I'm getting you back. Come on, y'all. I'm speaking to somebody out there. You can become resentful. <laughs> you, remember, you remember Joseph? Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. And finally, they had to come meet Joseph. And Joseph could have chewed them out. He could have beat them up. He could have, he could have had their heads chopped off because he was the man. But he said this, you meant it for evil. Yes. Amen. But God meant it for good. Yes. What people may mean for evil for you, look at it from God's perspective and understand that God is using that for good. For your good, for his glory. Amen. Amen. How can be, being betrayed be, be good for, for me? Being betrayed means that you stop trusting everything else and really start trusting God. Being betrayed can reveal that your heart is not as loving as it should be. Being betrayed means it gives you the opportunity to exercise what God does, and that's forgiveness even when you don't deserve it. Without strong faith, we can become resentful, we can become depressed, and we can even abandon our faith altogether. We can become fearful. We can give up. We can isolate ourselves. I'm not going to that church. I'm not going. No, I had enough of church, folk. I'm not going anymore. Well, you're not going for the folk. You're going to worship God. Amen. Yes. People get that confused. Amen. Amen. They get caught up on the folk instead of getting caught up on the Lord. Yes. Amen. 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 Yes. Because if you look at folk, you're going to find imperfections everywhere. If you look at yourself, you'll find imperfections everywhere yes. as well. There are no perfect persons or people. Amen. Only God is perfect. And you're coming to worship God. You're coming to worship God. Many people have abandoned their faith simply because of what has happened or what has gone on. They isolate themselves. They become despondent. They become distressed. And all of these things can happen if we respond incorrectly. Amen. But to get on the right road, to, 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 to go uh, and see beyond what we can see to what God can see. The, the servant got up and he saw all of these chariots around him. All of these warriors getting ready to pounce on him. <laughs> because he was seeing what? In the natural. He was seeing in the natural. Many times we don't see God because we're busy seeing in the natural. Yes. Everything has to be natural. But God is a supernatural yes. God. Amen. And so if we're going to see what God sees, we've got to align ourselves with God. We have to close our, our physical eyes and our physical selves and open our spiritual eyes and our spiritual self. 
Woo! Did y'all get that? Amen. And many times we cannot make the transition. We either can't make the transition or we don't want to make the transition. We want to hold on to our resentfulness. We want to hold on to our pride. We want to hold on to our unforgiveness. We want to hold on to our self-righteous justification. You get what you deserve, but if we got what we deserve, we would not be here today. God has not given us or dealt with us as we deserve. songwriter said he looked beyond my faults which were many and he saw my need so how do we grow in our faith let me press on real quick here how do we grow how do we get from where this man this young man was seeing all these Soldiers and armies around him, realizing that they were outnumbered, realizing that, that they, were, they were about to be killed because all he saw was, were men with weapons and horses, and they were coming together. But Elisha saw something else. Hallelujah. Thank God for Elisha. Elijah saw something else. Elijah saw what this young man couldn't see. Elijah saw that God was still on the throne. Amen. Elijah saw that God is for him. Elijah saw that God is his protector. God was his provider. And so he told the young man, and that's why those of us who walked in the faith for a while, we've got to grab somebody by the hand and tell them, close your eyes and look to God. Close your physical eyes and open your spiritual eyes, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. And he told the young man, he, he told before he told the young man, he prayed to God. If you want somebody to grow in Christ, you can't beat them in Christ. You can't, you can't uh, rough up and talk to them and criticize them to Christ. But you can pray that they receive Christ. You can pray that they operate in Christ. You can pray that they go forth in Christ. And it says Elijah prayed to God that God open his eyes. Yeah. Well, his natural eyes were already open. So what was Elijah praying for? That God would open his spiritual eyes. That God would let him see what he couldn't see in the natural. Oh, glory. Sometimes we just see a defeat when God says this is just a stepping stone. Sometimes we see a stumbling block. And God says this is only a way to grow closer to me. It's how we see it from God's perspective. Take off your, your own self glasses and put on spiritual glasses. Then you'll be able to see what God sees. And when you see what God sees, then you can see way down the road. You can see clearly what's about to happen. And he said, open the young man's eyes, Lord. I pray that you open his eyes. And God heard his prayer. And God did what? Opened his eyes. And he saw God's folk, God's angels. Surrounded all around him. But some of us just like to stay in our natural. Because it feels good to our natural. It feels good to our flesh. It feels good to our own nature. But if you're going to see what God wants you to see, you got to open your spiritual eyes. you gotta, you got to open those eyes that, that help you see what God sees. And he says he's opened his eyes. And then he saw God. He saw the, 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 the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around who? All around Elisha. God has protection all around each one of us. We can't see it, but it's there. It could happen when, when you didn't have the car wrecked. It could have happened when the tree didn't fall on your house. It could have happened when you were able to get up and walk and, and, and not fall down. It, it could have happened when, when your loved one has gone to work and God brings them back safely yeah. 
to your home. God has something for somebody, but you can't see it until you put on your spiritual eyes. You can't see it until you get out of yourself and get into Christ. You can't see it until you ask God, open my eyes. I just see somebody that hates me, but I want to see what you see. We stay stuck in the hate. We stay stuck in the unforgiveness. We stay stuck in the anger. We stay stuck in the resentment. We stay stuck in all of the stuff that makes us feel justified. But God said no. He said just as I forgave you, you forgive one another. And I'm not saying all of this is easy, but I'm saying through Christ, it's all possible. Glory. Hallelujah. Let me move on. Two truths that, the, that we must bury deep in our hearts if we're going to see things from God's perspective. One, God loves us unconditionally. Let that sink in. That sounds so simple, but let that sink in. God loves us unconditionally. He loves us even when we mess up. He loves us when we do good. He loves us when we do wrong. He loves us when we forgive. He loves us when we don't forgive. You can't change God's love because you didn't create God's love. God gave us, poured out his love. God made the choice to love us. He made the choice to love us. The second thing is, when you trust totally in him, he will not allow you to be defeated. Failures may happen. Things may not turn out the way you intend. But ultimately, God will be glorified, and we will be blessed. Let me give you a few things, and then I'm almost done, about God seeing faith. God seeing faith. If you want to look beyond the physical and see the spiritual through Christ, let me give you some things from the lessons from David. First of all, you have to recall God's past victories in your life. How quickly we forget how good God has been to us. How quickly we forget how much God has forgiven us. How quickly we forget that we make mistakes too. Amen. Recall past victories when God gave you the victory. Secondly, reject discouraging words and associations. Don't hang out with somebody that's unforgiving if you're struggling with forgiveness. <laughs> Amen? Amen? We will run to our friends, and, and, and what do you think? Well, you know, well, I think you ought to do that. I think you ought to do that. <laughs> run to God. Yes. Say, not my will, Lord, but thy will be done. Reject discouraging words and associations. Sometimes you got to step back from some relationships that are toxic, that are poisoning you against God. The only thing that keeps us connected to, to, to people that discourage or people that, 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 that are like-minded is our own pride and self-justification. Our pride. And don't say you don't have any, because everybody does. The key to cure is recognizing what's wrong. Pride resists God. (laughs) You can try to justify it all you want to, but pride resists God. If you're resisting God right now, I guarantee you, somewhere in your heart, there's some pride. Amen. Let me go on. Not only recall past victories, not only reject discouraging words, but also recognize the true nature of the the battle. It's a spiritual battle. 
And victory comes through God's ability, not ours. We want to be fixers. I want to be a fixer. You want to be a fixer. I want to fix this. I want to feel vindicated. I want to feel justified. I want to fix this. But some things you can't fix yourself. You got to put on the spiritual eyes of God and leave it in his hands because there is no failure in God. Things may be impossible with man, but with God, all things are possible. Wow. Boy, I'm preaching. Fourth, not only must you recognize the true nature, not only must you reject discouraging words, not only must you recall past victories, but you got to release all your fears, discouragement, anger, and negativity. You got to release it to God. That means before you can release it, you got to come to terms with it. Say, Lord, I hate that person and mean it. But I, <laughs> but you know what? Something deeper inside of me saying, <laughs> I, <laughs> I got to love them. The, the me don't want to love them, but the you in me. Ha! Whoa! But the you in me. The you in me is greater than anything that I've ever experienced. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. Hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your word tells me, forgive. I don't want to, but nevertheless, I'm going to put on my spiritual eyes and trust you, Lord, to give me that which I can't do myself. Yes. Amen. Release it. Release it to God. God already knows it's there. The only one you're fooling is yourself. Yes. <laughs> the Bible says he knows everything in the heart. <laughs> That's why you don't have to hide from God. Because he already knows what's in there. He just wants you to know. <laughs> and say, do you want to stay that way? He asked the man, do you want to be healed? He didn't have to ask him that. That was obvious. The man wanted to be he, he saw the man needed to be healed. Why you ask me, do I want to be healed? Because your will has to line up with mine. You have to surrender to my will and my way. And that's the same thing it is with God. If you're, gonna, if you're going to, to move forward in your faith, you've got to release all that negativity to God. Yes. And don't pick it up again. Yes. Amen. Let me move on. The fifth thing is respond with a positive confession. I may have lost this job. I may not have done this or that right. But guess what? God is with me, and I know he's going to put me on a path of righteousness. Amen? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I may fail the first time, the second time, but I'm going to keep God ahead of me. I'm going to keep my eyes on Christ, and I know that I'll get the victory because he's the one that leads me and guides me. And you have to respond with scripture. Amen. We want to say all kind of words, but we don't want to say scriptural words. You got to use scripture. What did Jesus do when he was, a, when he was confronted by Satan and tempted of the devil? What did he use? He used the word of God. Amen. You got to speak the word of God to others. You got to speak the word of God to yourself. Amen. I will not hate <coughs> because hate is not of God. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd yes. and I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. You got to keep, keep those things going. If God is for me, who can be against me? No weapon formed against me is going to prosper. I'm putting on my spiritual eyes so I can see what God sees. The sixth thing is very simple but very profound. Rely on the power of God. 
That sounds simple, doesn't it? But what do you really rely on? Amen? Do you rely, we rely on our intellect? We rely on our experience? We rely upon our education? We rely upon our jobs? We rely upon ourselves? We rely upon our ability, but we sometimes and every now and then we may rely on God. But what God spoke to me was you got to rely on him 100% of the time. When you get up in the morning, you got to rely on him. When you lay down at night, you got to rely on him. If you got to give a speech, you got to rely on him. If you got to give a sermon, you got to rely on him. If you're leading somebody to Christ, you got to rely on him. If you want to forgive somebody, you got to rely on him. If you want this job to open for you, you got to rely on him. If you want your life changed, you got to rely on him. Whatever it is, you got to rely on God. Lord, help us to rely on you. And you alone. Not how good we are. Not how smart we are. Not how good looking we are. Not how influential we are. Not how educated we are. But rely on God. Yeah. And when you rely on him, he won't give, he won't fail. Amen. He won't fail. How many of you ever trusted God and Amen. God came through every time? Hallelujah. When you couldn't call on his name, you may have been on your bed of affliction. You may be on the bed of sickness, and you just called to God and said, whatever it is, whatever your will is, I trust you. And God said, that's all I need to know. Now I can raise you up so you can give a testimony to my glory and to my honor. seventh thing, resolve the victory was through God. What do I mean? I mean, don't take credit for what God did. Give him the glory. Give him the praise. The Lord did this. The Lord raised me up. The Lord healed me. Yeah, you had some doctors. You had some medicine and all that's good, but God created the doctors. God created the medicine. God created the technology. God created it all. So God did the work. And I was the recipient. Yes. Give God the glory. Give God the honor. Many times we get the victory and we want to take credit for it. It was me. I, I told them. I changed the law. I cursed them out. I fussed at them. I sued them. I did this. I did that. But you can't do anything that God doesn't allow. Yes. And even at all of that, do you have peace after you've done all of that? Only God can resolve something. And you have the peace that passes all understanding. Let me get, let me get done. I just want to leave you with some scriptures here. First of all, John 14, 27 says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't let fear paralyze you. Don't let emotions get in the way of you seeing God. Psalm 25, 14, God reveals secrets to those who fear him. If you want to know the secrets of God, if you want to know the future of God, you want to know what, what you should do and when you should do it and how you should do it, you've got to submit and surrender yourself to God because he shows you the secrets, the things you don't see. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah 33 and 11 says, call upon me and I will answer and I will show you great and wonderful things that you don't know about. You don't know something, call on God. He'll show you what it is, how it is, when it is, where it is, who it is. He'll show it all to you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He will answer and show you great and mighty things. The things you don't know. The things that have not come into your mind. The things that you have not seen. The things your ears have not heard. The things that has not entered into your heart. God will show you those things when you humble and submit and surrender yourself to him. He'll show you great and wonderful things. That you know not of. Close your physical eyes. And open your spiritual eyes. Stop measuring your problems. Against your ability to handle it. Oh boy that was powerful. When God gave me that nugget. That was powerful. 
You know what causes anxiety and worry? It's trying to meet the problem in your own ability. Amen. That was transforming for me. Don't we try to do that? Don't we try to do things in our own ability? We see the problem and we figure out now how I'm going to handle this. That's the first thing we say. How am I going to deal with this? How am I going to deal with that? And what, what the Bible says, what Jesus is saying, what God is saying, what the Holy Spirit is, is saying right now is saying stop measuring your problems against your ability to handle or solve them. In other words, don't be your own God to fix it. Amen? Amen? Because the enemy will always exaggerate the physical that you see, the problem. Amen. He'll make it bigger than it really is. Yes. He'll make it more complex than it really is. He'll make it harder than it really is. He'll make it more confusing than it really is. And that's why you have to say, you know what? I can't figure this out, yes. but I know the one who can. Yes. And I tell you what, I had a problem last year. Yes. Jesus can work, yes. work it out. Yes. And he worked it out. And so I'm going to trust him again yes. to work it out. Amen. I'm going to trust him again to fix it for me. I'm going to trust him again to do what he said he would do. Oh, that's powerful. Let that sink in your spirit. Stop measuring your problems against your ability to solve them. Because the enemy uses that to magnify the problem and minimize your ability and your trust in God. Amen. Let me move on. Fix your eyes on God. Fix them. I mean, lock them in. Don't waver. You know, one day I'm loving God, the next day I don't talk to God. <laughs> one day I believe God, the next day I don't believe God. Fix your eyes on God. Read his word. Worship him. Thank him. Praise him. Pray and seek him. Then do as he directs. In closing, recall past victories. Psalms 145, verses 5 through 7. Recognize the true nature of the battle. Psalms 20, verse 6 through 8. Rely on the power of God. Psalm 66, verse 3 through five. Trusting God is seeing beyond what we see to what God sees. Now tell me, what do you see? What do you see? I hope you receive this word today. And I hope it takes root and brings fruit in your life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this opportunity to speak. I thank you, oh God, for your, your people. I thank you for your spirit. Now, Lord, I'm going to leave it in your hands because only you can change hearts, lives, save souls, revive people, renew people, and call people back to yourself. Lord, I just pray that your will be done. Your word will not come back void. I pray that your word will convict, challenge, comfort, and do that which you call for it to do. In Jesus' name, giving you the victory, giving you the praise, the honor, and the glory. Have thine own way. Amen. amen. And amen. Amen. If you're here today, either in our digital audience, our digital congregation, and you heard something today that spoke to your heart, and you want to, by the power of God, trust him. You're tired of operating in yourself. And you want to operate in what God shows and what God can 
can help you to see. And today you want to receive Jesus as your personal Savior because it begins with him. God has shown you today that you can't handle this on your own. You can't save yourself. Sin is there. But my love is there. My sacrifice of my son Jesus Christ is there that paid for your sins. The only thing you have to do is confess that you need forgiveness. That you have sinned. That you are a sinner. That you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. Turning from your way to God's way. And he said he will. He will save. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. If you've never done that in your life, then you're operating as that young man operated. Only in the natural. And one day the natural will perish. And your soul, which is the eternal spiritual part of you, will either return to the Lord if you know Jesus Christ, or it will be judged to be eternally separated from God. Hear his voice today. Allow him to work in your heart and in your life. If you need to recommit your life to the Lord, now is the time. If you need to recommit yourself to serving him, he's given you gifts for the ministry. He hasn't given you gifts just so you can sit down and be separated. He's given you gifts to bless his ministry and his people. And if you're not doing that, then you are really in rebellion and disobedience against God. Repent. That's all he says. Stop. Turn back to me. Obey me and do the thing. I ask you to do not out of obligation not out of fear but out of gratitude and thanksgiving realizing that he loves us that he sent Jesus to save us please let us know if you want to recommit your life. Please let us know if you want to commit, recommit yourself to the service of the Lord. Let us know if you want to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Let us know if you want to become a part of this body of believers. Whatever God is speaking to you, you have to take off your, your, your naturalness now and close your eyes and ask God in the spirit, what would you have me to do? And he will speak. He will urge and nudge and lead you to where he wants you to be. Father, we thank you now in Jesus' name. I commend and commit everyone within the sound of my voice to you. And I ask you to draw them unto yourself that truly your name can be glorified. We can walk and talk with you in harmony. We can see beyond our natural and see what you see. Help us to do that, oh God, by the power of your Holy Spirit. And in Jesus' name we pray. 
And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his throne with exceedingly great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, dominion, majesty, power, and might, henceforth, now, and forevermore. And now may the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, joy, hope, and love in the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks for this service. God bless. Amen and amen.